Okay, this is going to be a little bit strange because uh, you're not going to actually be able to hear uh, Alexander Sakurov giving his answers. You learnt, um, for technical reasons, you're only going to hear me translating them to you, which is going to be a bit weird. Um, but so what's going to happen is that uh, we're gonna, we've got a video uh, to show you about the making of this film, which runs for about three minutes. And while that's on, I'm going to get Alexander Sakurov on the phone. And then when I come back, it won't be me, it'll be him, but it'll be me talking to you. <laughs> so, uh, I'll be back shortly. Okay, we have uh, Alexander Sakurov on the phone from St. Petersburg. <laughs> So, uh, who'd like to ask some, a question? <coughs> uh, I would like to thank you all for your applause. <laughs> Congratulations on a magnificent uh, achievement. Watching the first two thirds of the film, I couldn't help but get the impression of a former Stalinist use of artist proper political propaganda. Would you care to comment? Скажите еще раз. Most, most of my life I've lived in the Soviet Union. And I really have experienced that I know what it really is. Before Perestroika, every film that I made, including my documentaries, were banned by the censors. So only when the political situation changed, those films of mine were released. And I must say that whenever the individual comes across the state, our experience in the Soviet Union proves that the individual wins and the state loses. We have a very powerful Russian culture of the 19th century to draw upon. It's a very rich culture. It's, it's a very inspiring tradition. And however paradoxical this might sound, I believe that the great Russian culture of the 19th century is not only our past, but it's also uh, our future. Because it's only true art that is, that is something that will never betray you. It will never, it will never let you down. Everything will change, the economy, the political situation, you know, different audiences will come with different tastes. But when, if we're talking about, you know, true art, it really is something that will always be there for you. It won't let you down. And that's really something that can unite all of us. And I think it's the main thing that unites all of us. What makes us human is that we have art. If we didn't have art, we would just be human-like uh, animals.
that's how I would answer that question. <laughs> and thank you for asking that question. Спасибо uh, еще раз uh, Спасибо еще раз <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering whether uh, the film Orlando might have been uh, an inspiration or an influence at all. Человек спрашивает, не видели ли вы фильм Орландо, который тоже был снят в Питере? It, I, I have seen that film and I think it's not bad. I think it's interesting in its own way. <laughs> Given the amount of preparation, how much time did you allow for the actors to rehearse that epic the. movie? Uh, how much time do you How much time in the preparation, the rehearsals, the pre-production for the actors to uh, вопрос, uh, вы, понятно, что вы очень долго этот фильм готовили. Uh, сколько времени вы уделили uh, работы с актерами? Как вы работали с актерами? Uh, we worked with the actors for uh, three months. We divided the actors into groups and worked with them that way. First we rehearsed with the main characters and then with the secondary uh, characters. Uh, I have to I have to point out that in this film everyone who's in the film is an actor they're they're all actors there's no extras as normally one would use in a film like this one would cast extras everyone in this film is a is a is a real actor the day the day that we shot this film all the theaters of St Petersburg which is quite a lot were closed down for that day <laughs> because all their uh, companies were all at the shoot. <laughs> and I have to say that we really had very, uh, the conditions for filming this film were complicated. Uh, we could only do one take. We couldn't do it again if something went wrong. because this is the 23rd of December, which is the shortest day of the year and, and the longest night. So the shooting time is only like, there's only light for about two and a half hours. And after two and a half hours, the sun sets really fast, suddenly it's dark. So because we only used natural light, we were really dip Ah, we, we, we use natural light. Ah. Yeah, we also used artificial light, but, be but because we, we needed uh, natural light for a lot of the shots, we really were tied to, uh, we, we were tied to that uh, two and a half hours. We really, uh, our shot depended on light coming from the outside. So realistically, we could only shoot in that two and a half hours when it was light outside. That's why we could only do one take and everyone had to be very well prepared. So to pull this off, you really need serious professional work from the actors. You can't have people that are going to make mistakes. 
and practically no one did make a mistake. So uh, I guess God helped us that day. Congratulations on a really beautiful triumph. But I, I thought one of the beautiful things about the film was the way in which the story and the single shot conception were, were working in such harmony. But what I was wondering was if one of those two ideas to tell the story of the Hermitage or to make a film in one shot came before the other? Of course, the idea, the concept of the film came first, and only after that I started thinking what is the most effective way to bring that idea across. Uh, I first came up with the idea for the film and worked on the treatment uh, in my diaries 15 years ago. And back then it was just an idea, there was no technical possibility of making this film. And I patiently waited until the technical possibility uh, came about. But I really would like to point out that the idea of only doing it in one take is not the main idea of the film and it's not the main concept of the film and it's not even the main, <coughs> the most important really technique in the film. The most important uh, part of the film is the art in, the, in itself, the art that's in the hermitage. Uh, the work of the actors the performances, the, the music and the sound design of the film. And obviously uh, creating a very special mood on the screen, creating a particular ambience. And out of all this came out the idea of really shooting the whole thing as one breath, not to manipulate with time, not to play with time, just accept it for what it is as, as, a, as a real thing. What I want is to be uh, on, on an equal footing with the audience, to be united with the audience. I wanted to create this feeling as if I could take all of the audience, each of you, by your hand and lead you personally through this incredible journey of art that's in that building. And nobody gets in our way, nobody interferes with our little tour. There are no interruptions, everything flows just as it's supposed to flow. There's music, uh, there's a soundtrack to our, to our stroll through the museum. The paintings float past us as we walk. We flow through uh, different eras, through different periods of history. <laughs> we, 
we can travel to different eras and we can be in all the eras at the same time. See, it's possible. I mean, you know, all sorts of miracles are possible. Even the fact that I'm sitting in St. Petersburg and you're sitting in a, in a cinema and there's this huge distance between us. But we're still, uh, we're, we're united in time. We're existing in the same time. I can hear the translator's voice echoing through the room. <laughs> I can hear your voices. And I'm very grateful to you for this united breathing, that, for this kindness that I feel from the audience, which is everyone breathing together. And that's proof that anything is possible. There's really nothing <coughs> impossible when we're in the realm of art. Okay, that's, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> I could not help, but uh, I have been thinking nonstop about the um, film Nostalgia from uh, Tarkovsky and his main actor touching the pool sides while trying to protect the candlelight. Uh, I thought your char main character in your film is, um, has the same kind of purpose. Can you comment on that? And second question is, if, is your focus of course they're both about the same thing they both have this feeling of sadness for life. Both Andrei Tarkovsky and myself, we both regret that, you know, life is really very short and it really it ends a lot faster than you can do everything. Maybe there is some general sort of Russian tone that we have in common that, you know, you might pick up in Russian art, possibly. Because Russian art was never first and foremost about entertainment. It always saw the sadness in people's lives and brought that out. So it is possible that there are things in common between those films. And thank you for that comment. Uh, is your focus puller still alive? <laughs> the focus puller, is he still alive after the film? <laughs> focus puller, is he alive? Focus puller. Focus puller. Focus puller. Спрашивает про, не знаю, помощник оператора жив после этой съемки. Помощник операторская группа. Of course, for the whole crew and the camera crew, this was a big problem. This film. Because you could, your normal steady cam operator is going to shoot for you know six, seven minutes, one shot. He, so apart from anything else, yes, they all put in a great deal of physical uh, effort into shooting this film. So they were training before <laughs> doing, work, working out. But after the shoot, the DOP was looking pretty good. <laughs> of 
of course, you know, but towards the end of the film, you could see that really, you know, they were very tired and, you know, breathing was a problem. In the scene where we're walking into Nicholas II's dining room with his whole family, the DOP really looked like, you know, he had no strength left. <laughs> so, you know, we had to really tell him, like, come on, you know, it's only a bit left, you can do it, you can do it. It's <laughs> And really there was like a second wind on the set and, and the crew really went for it and, and the whole thing was completed and it was very impressive. But yeah, you're right, it really was a, a really big physical challenge, you know, for... <coughs> of course, I have to say that visually the cameraman didn't manage to do everything that was planned in that shot. Because usually a steady cam operator is not the DOP. In steady cam operators are a very particular, you know, it's a profession and people who are steady cam operators generally do just that then don't get asked to, you know, just do the whole thing themselves. Yeah, the steady cam operator is it's its own thing. They're, they're, it's a separate kind of skill and they usually just do their own thing. And there is always a cinematographer who actually lights the film and, and makes a lot of those decisions. So after we shot the film, we also had to do a great deal of work in post-production on you know, to get the film visually looking the way that you see it on the screen. There was a lot of colour grading, we did a lot of, uh, we adjusted a lot of lighting. Sometimes we had to introduce new shades, the mood wasn't quite right, we had to crop the image and change the composition. There was a lot of digital post-production there. And we used uh, the Inferno and Da Vinci systems. Anybody who works in post-production or, or deals with digital uh, images probably knows those machines. Mm -hmm. As art is one of the uh, central themes to the movie, what do you think images mean and how do we see them as the viewer and the audience? Sort of how do we see art and sort of what do you think it means to <coughs> us when we, when we look at art? It's a very complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
because images can uh, help perfect a person. They can develop a person's mind, being, you know, and they can also be very destructive. They can destroy a person. Because, in effect, when we're looking at an image, the image makes us passive. We're, we're given some, we're presented with something that is either an accomplished, brilliant, you know, work of art, or something that is really low and 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 repulsive and destructive and, and harmful. Sometimes there's both of those qualities combined in one image. So even when you look at a great painting, let's say you're looking at a, a Rembrandt, you know, you're still uh, rendered passive by that image. You're looking at it, you're examining you know, different parts of it, but the artist is still uh, above you. The artist is still uh, has put himself in a superior position above you, um, and you're rendered passive by just looking at the image. your integrity, your individuality, your independence, whenever you're looking at an image, is very small. But let's say we're talking about a book. Just think for a moment how much more active you are when you're reading a book, how much more uh, you are collaborating with the artist and participating in the process when you're reading a book. When, when you read a book, you are active, you're participating, you're doing something. The distance between you and the author is the smallest compared to all other works of art. You, you, you come closest to being united with the author. You're perfectly free in creating your own subtext of the work, of, of creating your own philosophy of the work. And the author of a book makes you a co-creator, makes you a participant in the creative process. And that's something that's really uh, fundamentally important. The, uh, the, the appearance of film and other uh, visual, other, time, other art that's based in time Uh, the position of the human being has been uh, somewhat crushed, been lowered. So, you know, a person doesn't even have to know a single letter, doesn't have to know how to read or write. And film makes people even more passive. And, it, and as a result of film and video, people are, 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 are less free. <coughs> and what's more, the intimacy that exists between the reader and the writer, say, in reading a book, that intimacy disappears when you're talking about, you know, film or TV. So we, so we see that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of moral qualities, if you like, uh, disappeared from society as a result of, you know, the moving image. If you're talking about painting and visual art like that, then we really uh, should focus on the best examples of it.
the great artists are always there to remind us that the image and the idea can be perfected, they can be made perfect. It is the artists that have given us that cognition between the image and the idea and proven that they can uh, work in conjunction with each other, they can work in unison. And also uh, they've shown us that great art survives not only uh, its author but the, but the whole era. Uh, whenever I look at, you know, my favorite paintings that I love, those of uh, El Greco or Rembrandt, uh, it really amazes me that, you know, human beings have really perfected those ideas so long ago, that those, those concepts have really been around for so long. Art has long ago become grown up and perfect. The human soul, uh, the human soul has long ago developed and become perfect. And it becomes obvious that progress, as we understand it, is really meaningless in life. Because all the uh, important discoveries have already been made. And I'm really convinced that no one ever is going to be better than Rembrandt or Tchaikovsky or Dostoevsky or Faulkner, for example, or Dickens, you know. There's nothing that's going to be really deeper than what's been, no one's going to go any deeper. They just uh, come up with reinterpretations of those ideas. And it's really important that, you know, you really shouldn't expect anything new from art. Art's not going to give you anything new. Art isn't there to, to really teach you anything new. It's just there to repeat things again and again in a relevant way. It just repeats the same things. Because, you know, the world is just constantly refilled with new and new people that haven't heard it before. And, and new people have to hear the same ideas and the same messages over and over again so that they can uh, become involved in human life. They can participate in society. If art doesn't stop like a maniac repeating everything again and again and again and showing people, you know, left from right and right from wrong, uh, if it's only the artists that can do that. No one else is qualified. That's what I think. So that's why the Hermitage is such a unique place for me that I love so much. And it's one of the most special places in St. Petersburg and in Russia. It's a unique world, it's a whole world in there. Who would we, what would we be that without places like that, without museums like that? Because I see a museum as a place where art is protected. And it's a very ethical place, it's a very moral place, if you like. Only when you, when you go to a museum, you really become aware of just how much has happened before you, how much people have come up with and thought before you. 
it teaches you that really, you know, everything that's been done before you. They didn't have communications like we do. And they didn't have cars. And they didn't know about, you know, world, world wars and all the military technology. But Bregel painted what he painted. And El Greco painted what he painted. And Dura. And what Beethoven composed is not even subject to analysis. You can't even analyze it. Somehow he just tied everything up long be like for centuries to come. So that's a very long answer to that question. <laughs> I'm sorry for, for going on a bit. Alexander, um, I noticed in the, in the credits that uh, Martin Scorsese was mentioned. Um, what influence did he have in the movie, if that is the filmmaker? He helped us find producers to find funding. He actually put, proposed it to us. He found out that we were, we were planning a film like this and he got in touch and wanted to help. He didn't influence the film in any way. He had no input into the actual making of the film whatsoever. But he, he liked some of my films and he just felt that, you know, he wanted to help in some way. So he really gave some moral support to getting that off the ground. And I was really, it was very valuable. I really value greatly his, you know, he was very emotional. He wanted to do it. He was very sympathetic to what we were planning. But we're very different people, him and I. We're very different. But for some reason, he likes my work. Yeah, Alexander, um, the cinematography was quite extraordinary. I was interested that from treatment to release, it must have been over 15 years. And it came out at a very poignant time in, in history, particularly with the war in Iraq. Did you think that it was ironic that the film of all times in history would come out now? And, and how did you feel about the looting of the um, museum in Baghdad? Интересно, что фильм мог выйти в любое время, но, но он вышел как раз в такое время, он вышел одновременно с войной а, в Ираке. Как вы считаете, а, какую, ну, как, как так получилось, что вот, как вы считаете, вот именно а, ну, роль времени, когда фильм выпущен? То есть, как... И еще, так, и еще вторая часть вопроса. Видели ли вы на, а, на то, что громили музей в, в Багдаде? About the uh, looting in Iraq of the museum, yes, I, I have satellite TV and I did see some of that horrific uh, footage of what was happening there. So on the satellite, basically, I watched Iraqi TV and I watched European news. What, the, uh, what happened in Iraq in the museum is just another example of how modern politics, particularly the politics of the United States, uh, is dehumanizing to everyone.
so only only crazy people you know could crazy people were the only ones that didn't tell the Americans that by going into Iraq they were falling into the oldest trap a trap that's been around since ancient history and of course you know everything is you know it's all a crime of the United States and particularly that they allowed uh, the museums to be looted Of course, I believe that the United States have to be condemned and, you know, put on trial for these uh, terrible crimes that they've committed. And it would have been really simple for them, you know, to protect the heritage of the country, to protect the museums. And they are dehumanized themselves and they are dehumanizing others. And the dehumanizing effect of American politicians is so obvious that uh, you know. Actually, America is really becoming a big problem for humanity. <laughs> so, just to say something, I'm Russian and I'm embarrassed for what he's just said. That is why a lot of people have left Russia because of people like him. No, you have to say this to him and he's After. intelligent. It is embarrassing. What does he have to say for Putin and his policies and the Russian policies now? А, ну тут протесты зала, что а как насчёт политики Путина и нельзя не сказать про про то, что он делает. But we were talking about museums. No, we were talking about America and dehumanization. I think Russia. Нет, это просто это все из дегуманизации. Of course, no, the same goes for Russian politicians, but we were particularly talking about museums. But of course, exactly the same thing would go for them. Without any question, the same goes for the Russian politicians. No, the politicians are dehumanized and are dehumanizing others in Russia just as they are in the United States. But they do it in different places in different ways, of course. And the processes going on in those two countries, for example, are different to each other, and you have to also see the difference between them. But, but those politicians, well, in a sense, they're also the products of their society. They're the children of their society. We can see that, that you know, American society has big problems, Russian society has big problems, and we can see how the politicians are dealing with them, and really it's very, quite apparent what, what's going on, and, and we, we all understand it. And I, I, I don't believe that in Australia you have perfect politicians in an ideal society. As for the coincidence that was mentioned of the film being released at the same time as the war, of course that's a coincidence, that's coincidental. And in the time that, that you know, I've been planning this film, there have been a lot of events, so many events have happened. And each, at any time the film would have coincided with something. But on the other hand, I really do understand why you've asked that question and why you've pointed that out. Because the contrasts are really quite strong. As in the contrast between the great efforts made by artists and what, and, and at the other end of the spectrum, the basic things that societies feed off in different countries. Because, I mean, the Americans all supported their president in the war, didn't they? A lot of them. So that's already something that we have to remember. It's a very sad fact, but a fact nonetheless. And look at the sort of films that that American filmmakers are throwing 
out into the world. It's essential. Uh, first of all, I mean, before the bombs, there was bombing with American movies. <laughs> and then after that, the real bombs follow. But American people really do love American movies, that's for sure. I'm sure in Australia most people like American movies. But really a primitive culture can have incredible destructive force. A primitive culture uh, bears fruit to uh, aggression. And that leads to, you know, death and that's all portrayed. That process is portrayed in the films. You know. <coughs> so, you know, young people are no more afraid of killing. You know, death, death becomes all part of life's show. And filmmakers, <coughs> you know, sh show with incredible detail, you know, how the bullet hits the person and the person writhes in agony and it's all shot very nicely. And death, in the, death and the screen becomes like a normal combination. So that's getting into heavy territory. Probably should stop there. <laughs> I would just like to say, hmm? I'd like to say that that, that you know, primitive, sort of very basic art, sort of very illustrative art, is a very uh, destructive force. Literal art is a destructive force in the society. Art and culture should not at any time, you know, bow to the whims of the, of, the, of, the, of the audience. You know, art and culture is not a restaurant. They should show people some alternative, some alternative way of thinking, an alternative way of seeing things. In other words, that otherwise there's just this disintegration in the society, this anarchic disintegration, which is really what's happening in, you know, before our eyes. Thank you for the question. Me cash time is up. Me